Welcome everyone. It's just gone uh, half past in the UK, so we're going to make a start. Welcome to today's IID debates uh, hosted in partnership with the International Development Research Centre on managing debt, climate and nature in the pandemic recovery. My name is Juliet and I will be providing some technical support during this session. So with that, I am really pleased to introduce Julie Schuldis, who is the Vice President for Strategy, Regions and Policy at the International Development Research Centre and our moderator for today's event. Thanks very much. And Julie, over to you. Thanks very much, Juliet. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, merci beaucoup d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui pour la séance que nous avons. Um, as Juliet mentioned, my name is Julie Scholdeis. I am the IDRC's uh, Vice President for Strategy, Regions and Policy, and it's a real pleasure to moderate the discussion today. Um, I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, Canada, and would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which our office is located is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Ashinaabe people. Today's uh, event has a fantastic lineup of speakers. The Honorable Bob Ray, Yuneka Jean-Paul Adam, Professor Stephanie Griffiths-Jones, Dev Useri, and Sejal Patel. And I'll introduce each of them in a couple of minutes. It's equally a pleasure to be organizing this event with IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development, one of the world's premier think tanks in the field of climate change and its impact on vulnerable communities in the global south. Before I turn to our first speaker, let me say a few introductory words about why we're here. The International Development Research Center, IDRC, supports researchers in the global south to help address their most important challenges. After the COVID-19 outbreak, we mobilized our resources and are currently supporting some 20 research teams that are analyzing economic policy responses to the crisis. The economic impact of COVID is enormous, as I'm sure you're all very aware. Policy options for lower income countries are extremely, extremely limited which IDRC supported research from ODI and partners has already shown. On top of that, over the last couple of years, countries in the global south have experienced pressure of public or sovereign debt. Public debt was a growing challenge even before the pandemic and the economic crisis that came with the pandemic has intensified it. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said this past weekend, the world faces severe problems of debt sustainability in the wake of the coronavirus crisis that have not been properly understood or addressed and which threaten to tip developing countries into a rising wave of hunger, poverty, social unrest and conflict. I can think of no better reason or explanation of why this is so important. Many lower income countries experience high levels of debt distress. Some have defaulted. More than 70 countries are eligible for a temporary suspension of debt service payments owed to bilateral creditors. The G20 has also called on private creditors to participate in this effort. Discussions about expanding special drawing rights are also ongoing. But current debt, rel debt relief may not be enough. It's very likely that the management of public debt will play a very important role over the coming years. And as speakers this morning will emphasize, it is important that we, in the international development community, strengthen participation of Southern actors in these debates. The big question that we're putting forward for this webinar and our participants, and the next one in our series that will occur on April 1st, is how can we ensure that commitments for SDGs and climate do not suffer in the wake of what's currently going on? As countries are dealing with the pandemic and economic challenges, they're also addressing the reversals of progress against the SDGs and the need to address the ongoing climate crisis. We're presenting this webinar ahead of the spring meetings of the World Bank and IMF starting next week to contribute knowledge, evidence and lessons on how economic, social and environmental considerations can be brought together. Today, we'll be hearing about how the current global debt crisis is evolving. We'll hear about lessons from previous debt crises and specifically, We'll hear of how the pressure of growing debt has severely impacted efforts to tackle the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. And then how, to sustainably and innovative, how sustainable and innovative debt management can help enhance outcomes for nature and climate. So without further ado, let me turn to our first speaker. And it's wonderful to have with us this morning, Professor Stephanie Griffiths-Jones, an old friend of IDRC and known to many of you. 
She is Emeritus Fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, currently Director of Financial Markets Program, the Initiative for Policy Dialogue in New York, and has written widely on global finance. She will first set out for us the background of the current context of debt. Stephanie, I pass over to you. Thank you very much, Julie, um, for the, your kind introduction. Um, and I would like to thank also IDRC and Arjun Dehan and IIED for organizing this very important and timely event. In fact, the timing couldn't be better. Yesterday, the UN, at the UN, the heads of state met to discuss precisely debt relief. And as Julie said, uh, next week we have the spring meetings. So the, the situation for both African and low-income countries debt is very serious. And in a paper we've just finished with Marco Carreras, uh, we looked at first at the debt of Africa, its level and structure. If you can show the slide, please. And you can see that the IMF projected public debt to GDP in general in emerging markets and developing economies has increased by 10% due to the impact of the COVID crisis to approximately 65% of GDP by end of this year, which is the highest level it's ever been. And I also wanted to quote UN Secretary General Gutierrez, who said that the response to COVID and the financial aspects of the crisis has been far too limited in scope and too late. And I think this is perhaps the main lesson from the history of debt crisis, which unfortunately have been many, which is that the response of the international community in terms of granting debt relief has tended to be always too little, too late, and therefore has harmed development prospects of uh, the debtor countries in a very serious way. So it's, it becomes very desirable for uh, low-income countries and vulnerable middle-income ones, which have unsustainable debt burdens, should be given sufficient debt relief, and that at least part of that relief should be channeled to low carbon and inclusive recovery. The next please. Can I? So there has, what is interesting to try and think about how this debt relief should be granted, uh, it's, it's important to look at the structure, both of African debt in this case, and then of low-income countries' debt. Um, the share of African bilateral debt, which is mainly owed to the traditional uh, so-called Paris Club members, because they meet in Paris, there are typically the Europeans, the, the Americans, uh, North Americans, I should say, um, Japanese, uh, has fallen dramatically. In Africa, it, it fell from 52% in 2000 to, sorry, it, it, it went up from 27% in late um, in 2000. Uh, I'm sorry. In 2000, uh, 52% was held by these traditional Paris Club creditors. And now it's fallen to almost half to 27%. So there's been a major decline of these traditional bilateral creditors. And this has been accompanied by a major rise of China as a, as a big creditor. And secondly, by a very important increase of debt owed to commercial creditors, particularly bondholders, which now accounts for about 40% of Africa's total external public debt, compared to 17% in the year 2000. So just to summarize, the three top creditors to Africa since 2015 are bondholders, private bondholders, China, and the World Bank. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, now I want to focus on, on the poorest countries, which of course, have the highest levels of poverty and where if you don't give sufficient debt relief in a timely way, uh, the levels of poverty and deprivation and the ability to meet the SDGs will decrease dramatically. Um, so the share of total debt as a proportion of GDP has grown for both low income and low middle income countries. The debt owed to private creditors, which I showed for the rest for all of Africa 
as being increasingly important is less important. And I think that's interesting. It's one of the findings of our research. It's only just above 10%, whereas it's much more for the more high income countries. And again, like for the case of Africa, China more than doubles its exposure to low income countries between the first and the second half of the decade by more than 130%, becoming the second largest credit. If I can have the next slide, please. So what are the policy conclusions? And I will stop drowning you in, in numbers. So again, I want to repeat, because I've studied so many debt crises, too many. The key lesson from the history of debt relief is that it has to be sufficiently large and sufficiently timely to avoid what we call in Latin America in the 80s, a lost decade to development. And then this story was also repeated in Africa and in some of the um, crisis countries in Europe, because this would also undermine these lost decades of development, uh, lead to a decline in output, in investment, increases in poverty, and more generally undermine SDGs. And on top of that, we have this new element because we have this uh, global emergency of climate and also high inequality in most countries. So there seems to be a very clear need to link debt relief with sustainable and inclusive development. And therefore, uh, we think that part of the debt relief, an important part, should be linked specifically to projects and programs oriented to transform debt economies into greener and fairer ones. If I can have the next slide, please. So we need sufficient debt reduction for those countries needing debt relief in lower middle income countries and middle-income countries in Africa, as well as the small island states. And in these countries, in general, we need equal treatment of public and private creditors to avoid that part of the debt relief, which is given by public creditors, is used to service private debt creditors. So that the transfer would be from one set of creditors to the others rather than to the countries. Securing debt relief from private creditors may require both carrots and sticks. The former, the carrots, may include, for example, credit enhancements or guarantees, which could be, for example, from the World Bank or IDA or the African Development Bank in the case of African economies. And in that sense, it could build on the experience of the so-called Brady bonds, which uh, emerged as a solution to the Latin American debt crisis where there were credit enhancements given, and that helped significantly uh, encourage uh, private creditors to give sufficient debt relief, to take a haircut, as private creditors like to call it. For most low-income countries, especially those that have not raised bonds, debt relief from private creditors seems actually relatively marginal. And this is one of the findings of, of our research. And so it may be more desirable, initially especially, to focus efforts of debt relief on public creditors. And it is absolutely essential that any debt relief includes Chinese creditors in equivalent ways to other public creditors. And the Chinese creditors are included uh, in, in the joint discussions of debt, as they increasingly are, but not completely formally yet. And finally, if I can have my last slide, please. So uh, the G20 late last year designed a common framework, which is a positive step. It needs to be transformed to allow comprehensive debt relief for green and inclusive recovery to help low-income countries and vulnerable middle-income countries respond to COVID, recover, and invest increased in increased resilience and development. And therefore, all leaks and mix whose debts are considered unsustainable, not all of them are, should be supported by the international community to participate in debt restructuring. And on the other hand, as a sort of quid pro quo, governments receiving such debt relief would need to, to commit to reforms and investments that align their policies and their budgets with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement. 
So I think the time to act is now uh, because every, every month we leave, uh, there are people, additional people going into poverty um, and uh, additional um, missed opportunities for investment in climate resilience and uh, climate mitigation. So I, I, I finish with an urge and a request for rate debt relief now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, that was a wonderful way to start off and, and, and I think um, a good place um, in terms of both context setting, but also reflecting on where we need to go from here. We'll now turn to Dev Usuri. Dev is Director and Technical Expert at Debt Markets and Public Financial Management Consulting Limited. He will summarize for us key lessons from earlier debt crises and successes and challenges in integrating development objectives into debt relief. I pass it over to you, Dev. Thank you. Um, okay, let me first uh, say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, IAD and uh, IDRC for inviting me to participate in this uh, very topical event. Um, we have heard a little bit about the, <clears throat> the, 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 the issues that we need to be looking at. So I'm not got the context, et cetera. So I'm not going to be talking too much about it. So if we can move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I will just make a couple of uh, uh, very quick footnotes on, on the context. Uh, clearly the pandemic has been uh, creating a lot of different sort of havoc in the different countries, in our different countries where we're working, where we are, we are seeing all sorts of issues there. And uh, myself personally, when <clears throat> uh, working with those governments, I found, for example, how their budget was actually got, getting crazy in terms of uh, <clears throat> the, fiscal, the, the squeeze in their budget, the having to invest into uh, health and uh, social sectors. And all in all, when we see all that, there is something that gets squeezed out. And obviously what we see is that uh, uh, the investment that usually we would expect to see in uh, adaptation, climate change, adaptation, mitigation programs, et cetera, get squeezed out. And one would wonder whether in some countries, whether they are actually part of their going forward program. So that's a challenge. If you add to that the debt uh, burden now, so many countries getting into debt distress, then suddenly there's a big, big, big trouble ahead. Obviously, we welcome what the G20 has uh, come up with, the, uh, the, the suspension, the new framework, et cetera, et cetera. But clearly, like you heard, uh, Stephanie mentioned, there's probably, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And uh, obviously, and we hope that, we believe that something's going to happen sooner than later, but uh, at least the climate angle is going to be taken into account. Uh, we are, uh, uh, Currently working, for example, um, as, uh, as part of a small consortium, we are doing some debt climate nature work in West Africa. But today, what we're talking about here is about this global initiative, about this so-called international multilateral scale up initiative uh, that we hope the international community is going to come forward with and, uh, and, and something will be done about it, whereby the debt, the climate nature is going to take place. So I'll be sort of uh, uh, stepping back a little bit and talk, well, something that started 25 years ago, and I'm talking about here, the HIPIC initiative um, that was uh, established, that, was, uh, uh, that started in 1996, updated in 1999, uh, and uh, obviously uh, try to find out, are there some lessons that can be learned there? Uh, my, my topic today is clearly about uh, the framework itself. If we want to talk about the lesson from HIPIC, probably we need two hours, and obviously we don't have two hours. I have about eight minutes now, I think. And um, so we are going just to pick on a few things. I'll put a small footnote on the slide there. Uh, it's a small reminder, just in case, you know, like um, my, my daughter liked to uh, like that. She's a full 
climate, full on climate. But when I talk about that, she doesn't understand anything. So I'll put it there just to mention that uh, the HIPIC initiative was, if I can use the expression, it was in hibernation for some time, but suddenly we have Somalia uh, is, is within the process. And about four days ago, I, uh, there was a, some good announcement for Sudan at least about them also being sort of being considered for getting some debt relief under the enhanced EPIC. So it's not really uh, talking about history here. It's something that we can learn as we continue to see uh, some, some, something happening on the ground there. Somalia, Sudan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next slide, please. So like I said, so is there anything we can learn? Uh, can you press enter again, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, and like I said, we can talk a lot, but I'm going to pick on a few things that are relevant to the, to the framework that we're talking about, this scaled up approach. And the first one that comes to mind is obviously the comprehensive framework. And that was pretty good. People can say that the HIPIC had a lot of issues about it, but one thing which, and I remember somebody was mentioning at that time when we were working on the ground, we're talking, oh, that was a landmark initiative in the sense that it actually brought, uh, it was comprehensive, it brought everything together. Uh, so everybody together, but also all the issues together. That was number one. Number two, it was this macro framework this is the linkages, bringing in the reform and bringing in all those different issues that needed to be done. In fact, more, more, more when issues have been put there. I was looking at the Somalia one and I could, it reminded me of how many uh, things that needed to be done here. So there are lessons to be learned there in terms of the comprehensive framework, especially when we want something which is big, uh, which is going to have a big impact in terms of what we want to do. So that is one thing that we'll, I'll come back to, uh, to that later when we try to see what can we do with that comprehensive framework. And the link to that is a second one, obviously, is uh, you've heard already, we don't want this piecemeal approach. And there, HIPIC also taught us about this coordinated effort to bring in the multilateral, the bilateral, the Paris, uh, the Paris Club, the non-Paris Club as well, and the commercial creditors. Um, there were issues there. Not everything was successful. I still remember, for example, the statistics in terms of uh, the non-Paris club, but certainly the idea was uh, trying to get this so-called uh, comparability of treatment, try to bring everybody on board to provide those debt relief. It's something, this coordinated, uh, coordinated effort is something that we can learn from there. The third one, which for me is a favorite one, is about this link to poverty reduction. And that's pretty, uh, uh, pretty useful and pretty relevant to what we've been to we are talking about uh, today is about uh, uh, obviously climate, but there the link to poverty reduction, the strength and link between debt relief, poverty reduction, et cetera. And there again, one could argue that more could be done, but certainly there was something there to, to, to work upon. Increase in, in social spending was found from savings that actually uh, from debt, uh, from non-payment for, for, for writing off of certain debt, et cetera, et cetera. And there are some statistics there. As I said, more could be done, but there was something there. Uh, the other point is a promoting local ownership. Obviously, maybe some of uh, who are listening here will say, oh, local ownership. I mean, it's all, it was all driven by the international community. It was driven from external. But the reality is that there was countries developing their own poverty reduction strategy. They had a participation, bottom-up approach. Civil society participation was there. So I'm picking the ones that are positive. I mean, we, we could... Uh, talk a lot about the neg negative elements, but that was something which I think we can work upon when we're talking about this global initiative. And obviously, linked to that is a criteria. We want to see, for example, whether uh, uh, the money is being spent, the, the money that has been released is actually spent. And again, we can see it there. There were a few, there were indicators there, like an example that are provided in terms of increased expenditure on social services, et cetera, which we can work on. The final point here uh, on this one is about not Talking about the debt relief or debt uh, reduction, we want this new initiative to talk about debt management as well. So to, to give a chance, a menu of options. So here also there was a lot 
though, like I said, the focus was on debt relief, but there was something on debt management as well. I saw, for example, the one in Somalia, now they're talking about the flavor of the month nowadays is public debt transparency. So it's a lot about reporting. But in the old days, we, what we were doing, we were going to countries. And I remember in one country, completion point trigger was about building a database in a matter of a month. How can you do that? But that was something that needed to be done. So there was there was something about debt management and et cetera. So next slide. Deb, I'm going to have to give you the one minute warning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there. So here it's it's all about just taking everything that I've spoken now in one my one minute and converting it. So what do we do about all that? So obviously we need that big uh, framework agreement. Uh, and here to get everybody on board, to get the G20, to get, uh, hopefully there's going to be something at the spring meeting, hope on the side of the climate also. So whatever we're going to have in the COP, the, the, the US uh, on, on, on uh, meeting on, on climate change. So put a big push there, obviously get all the creditors together. That's very important and learning from the hippie process. The second one, obviously, I won't say anything. Uh, Stephanie has already said, we need, we've looked at the current, at the current, uh, the currency, the current, uh, the structure of the, of the, of the country's debt portfolio. And we need to do something about it. We can start with a small pilot and we can move on. The last three, the, the three elements that come, these are the ones where we're going to do a lot more in terms of the scaling up. And you're going to hear a little bit more about it. So I'm not going to say much. These big thing, we don't want to do the debt swap that was small, smallish uh, debt swap that we were doing in the past, in the 80s, et cetera, or even in the Hippic Initiative. We want something which is big, which is well scaled up, and we are going to hear about it. And linked to that, obviously, the local ownership, it has to happen. And in those countries, it is very important that it happens because for climate, it's not about the central level. It's also about the beneficiaries at the bottom there to get engaged to actually do the work. So hopefully, we're going to see that local ownership by using the local climate uh, strategy of the own of the countries. Uh, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about the KPIs. We have worked on that. We have uh, done, and these could be used also to work. And obviously, the debt relief and the, the debt management. This is something, like I said, would be there. So a menu of products, debt, uh, debt, uh, debt for nature, debt for climate, but something like uh, we could have a bit more in terms of uh, products uh, relating bonds and, uh, and and climate change, etc. And finally, just uh, I know I'm taking uh, some a bit more time, but the final point I would like to say is I conclude by this to say yes, we've been talking a lot uh, recently about those initiatives. We are all sort of passionate about it, but it's not about us. I think the most important one is about the decision makers. So we do hope that. Uh, uh, those who actually matter will take the decision in crystallizing the, this global initiative linking up debt, climate, and nature. Not in five years' time, but pretty soon now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Deb. And I hope there's a number of these things we can pick up in the Q&A section. Um, but I think that was really great to get that, that perspective um, that you bring um, over time. So now we're gonna to turn to Sejal Patel. Uh, she's a researcher in I I IIED's Shaping Sustainable Markets and Climate Change Research Groups. She will discuss how to link debt sustainability to climate and nature. What does the approach look like? What are the considerations and what role could various actors at the international, national and local level play? Over to you. Thanks, Julie. And hi everyone, really great to be here. Um, yeah, exactly. So following from Stephanie and Deb, I'll be talking about the urgency to link nature and climate and what that could look like um, to the to the debt management. Um, and we've, this is some work that we've been doing with UNECA and we have Jean-Paul Adam on this call who will also be able to give some remarks. Um, so just going on to the next slide. Uh, so the, the first map um, on the left shows external debt stocks as a percentage of GNI uh, in 2018. Um, and as Stephanie and Dev have already discussed, um, the updated figures, debt has been increasing since 2008 uh, and half the low income countries are already in high levels of debt distress um, and that urgency is rising. Uh, the second map shows stability across Africa um, and that's measured by the World Risk Index um, 
and the World Risk Index uh, calculates climate and na uh, nature disaster risks. Uh, and it's based on the calculation of exposure and vulnerability, uh, where vulnerability is defined as susceptibility, coping capacity, and adaptive capacity. Uh, so the, the darker pink on the map shows highly climate vulnerable countries. Uh, the, the Western and Central areas of Africa are the most climate vulnerable. So countries coming up high on the index include Cape Verde, uh, Djibouti, Comoros, Niger, Guinea-Bissau, um, and many others. Uh, the third map that we see here, it's the Jeff Benefits Index for Biodiversity. Uh, and that looks at the relative potential of each country to generate global environmental benefits in relation to biodiversity based on the species represented in the country, uh, their threat status, and the diversity of the habitat types in the country. The, uh, the darker green uh, uh, shows countries that require the greatest allocation to support their biodiversity uh, based on the represented and threatened species and habitats. And so some of the highest countries coming up here are Madagascar, South Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Cameroon, Kenya, and many others. Um, and then to go on to the fourth map, that shows the IDA Resource Allocation Index. Uh, and the, so the, the IDA, um, it's a part of the World Bank that supports the world's poorest countries with additional financing and typically more concessional financing. Uh, the index is used as a proxy, um, or we're using it here as a proxy for credit worthiness. Uh, so which impacts um, the, the credit worthiness, which impacts the uh, availability and cost of credit for countries. Uh, so the uh, allocation index maps out country performance based on four criteria. Uh, economic management, which includes fiscal policy and debt policy, Structural policies, including uh, trade and business regulations, uh, policies for social inclusion and equity, including gender, public resource use, and social protection, um, and public sector management institutions, including property rights and transparency, accountability, corruption, those kind of issues. Um, and what we can see on this map is um, some of the countries with the highest scores include Rwanda, Cape Verde, Senegal, Kenya, Uganda. Um, and, and there's many others. Uh, and then the final map shows all of these overlaid. Um, so we can see where the rising debt burdens are compounding with high climate and biodiversity vulnerability um, and where access to credit is limited. And then you can start building this picture of where this kind of coherent and integrated support is, is increasingly critical. Um, so we already have very high urgency in countries like Cape Verde, Kenya, Senegal, uh, Uganda, Madagascar, and many others. And with the pandemic, uh, the need is rising across all of the countries. Um, so, so one of the key points that Dev and uh, Stephanie were uh, raising as well is that the pandemic is exacerbating the debt situation, mounting uh, fiscal pressures, and that's taking uh, spending away from development, climate, and biodiversity needs. Uh, the economic impact also affects progress on SDGs. And the World Bank last year found that global extreme poverty was expected to rise for the first time in 20 years. Um, and as many as 150 million people uh, could be pushed into extreme poverty by this year, depending on the severity of the economic contraction. And so that's why acting now becomes critical and why linking all of these together becomes critical. Because if you focus just on the debt burdens, um, the nature, the climate crises could then undermine the economic recovery and the resilience of economies. Um, just going on to the next slide. Um, so this is, this is a map from UNECA's research that shows that many African countries are projected to lose two to 5% of their GDP uh, to climate change by 2050. And that's by conservative estimates. So the impacts of climate change are as pronounced as COVID-19 and will only worsen. Um, on the next slide, uh, we, we lay out this kind of um, need for debt management for climate and nature as an approach to coherently tackle these three crises. Uh, so what that looks like is the creditor and the debtor agreeing to restructure the debt in some way, whether that's a change in the terms, buying debt at a cheaper rate uh, on the secondary market or supporting conversion to a different type of financial vehicle. Uh, the transaction then leads to an amount saved on what the debtor would have had to pay back. 
and then the the saved amount is then invested in climate adaptation mitigation or nature and biodiversity activities so in effect what we have is the money that was going from the government budget to service the loan it's now going from the government budget to pay for climate and nature activities in country um, and then also adding that that transaction should also involve some proportion of debt write-off because these countries are having fiscal space issues uh, they're, they're needing that fiscal space freed up uh, to support other uh, key um, spending kind of priorities in health, education, and other areas. Um, so uh, on the next slide, uh, we we lay out some of the key lessons that Dev has um, Dev has explained. So uh, building uh, into the inter international architecture, uh, shifting to system uh, systemic programs, uh, and shifting to uh, using budget support where funds are paid into a debtor country's own budget. Um, and the advantage of that is that uh, it allows for a larger amount of funds to be mobilized, increases debtor government ownership and shifts accountability to national citizens. Uh, so the funds can then be managed as performance-based payments on agreed policy commitments like NDCs and biodiversity strategies. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, so what that means is that for the creditor, there's transparency on where that financing is going. They've redirected um, the debt services payments. Um, and for the debtor countries, uh, it means that there's greater ownership for that country to support nationally defined activities and then be held accountable by their own citizens. Um, so for example, uh, this could be um, what the Gambia had been doing in the process of developing the LTS, the long-term low emission development strategy, which is presenting their national priorities across the board. And what they could do is link instruments like this to those kind of plans and policies to usefully support operation, operationalizing those kind of policies. Um, and then on the last side, I'll very quickly look at incentives for different actors. Uh, so we have the ministries of finance and central banks and debtor countries. Um, and these, these actors are holding the incentive to undertake debt management linked to climate and nature to support economic growth, debt sustainability and ownership. Um, so debt are countries that um, also are approaching um, creditors for uh, debt management in this way are more likely to get a sympathetic hearing because those creditors are also wanting to contribute to international climate and nature commitments. Um, and it's it's showing evidence of funding activities that are already in place in those countries. Um, and there have been a number of debtor country leaders that have been expressing interest in high-level forums, for example, representatives of Cape Verde, Uganda, and Namibia, um, and, uh, and other countries. Uh, under the UN process, this represents new climate finance at a significant volume. Um, the other key actors here to mention are UK and China, who play um, Will play a role as hosts of the climate and biodiversity conventions this year. Um, then to touch on the private creditors which Stephanie has talked about um, and here for private creditors restructuring um, can be better than defaulting on loans so they'll still get a return if they support this kind of sustainability. Uh, then in the US Biden's climate plan uh, supports green debt relief for developing countries that make climate commitments. Um, so finally um, something um, also that's in development at the moment is an IMF, World Bank, OECD and UN platform um, that's that's being explored. And that could form a kind of international architecture that's needed for this kind of new, um, new HIPAA type of initiative that can help bring together these uh, debt, nature and climate um, into intersecting areas. Um, and I'll leave it there, thank you. Thanks so much, Stajal. You've given us a lot to think about and reflect on, and I'm sure that will come up in the Q&A period as well. Um, I now have the, the, the pleasure of turning towards two practitioners, and, and I'd like to thank them both so much for joining us today because I know how packed both of your schedules are and how much we look forward to hearing from your perspectives on the priorities highlighted here and how they relate to the work that you're doing. So first I'm gonna to turn to the Honorable Bob Ray, who's currently ambassador and permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations. He's led a very distinguished career as a Canadian politician, as a Canadian diplomat, including many humanitarian emergencies. I won't provide a full um, outline of the ambassador's biography, but suffice it to say, we're very honored to have you with us this morning. 
Um, Ambassador Ray, um, I, I turn the floor to you to kindly tell us about your and Canada's priorities to support responses to global debt and financing for development and how the research that we're doing can support these efforts. Ambassador Ray. Oh, thank you very much. It's good to be with, uh, with people who know what they're talking about. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Um, just completed yesterday the uh, co-chairing with uh, the secretary, Secretariat and with Jamaica of the, uh, of the meeting on, on debt uh, that we sponsored. We, Canada's co-chaired the Financing for Development Initiative at the UN with Jamaica uh, and the Secretariat for the last uh, couple of years. And obviously COVID uh, put us into high action, producing a number of initiatives and the roundtables that I know many of you participated in over the summer. Um, I want to just to, to summarize to say I think everybody I mean I, I think the the directions that are being set out are entirely right. Um, I, I what I want to do is try to point out some of the practical um, challenges that we face in in implementing uh, what's being proposed. Um, listening to the speeches yesterday, there was quite a substantial consensus. Uh, on a couple of fronts. One is that there has to be a much greater uh, commitment from the wealthy countries to uh, embracing and understanding the extent and nature of the uh, economic and social challenges facing the developing world as a result of COVID. Uh, secondly, that this is an opportunity, in fact, for us to uh, link the, the rebuilding process uh, to uh, the climate change agenda, uh, and, and we need to we need to figure out how to do that, and we need to figure out how to do that quickly. Uh, having said that, there are there are a number I think of challenges that we have to face up to um, that that need to be discussed uh, much more frankly. The first is to understand better uh, the uh, the on the, the the chronic debt issue. Uh, it, it erupts, it has erupted as a result of, of uh, uh, COVID-19. I mean, any, any seizing up of the economy, like as we have seen, is going, to, is going to on its own create substantial issues around debt and debt management and debt financing, liquidity and, and uh, uh, you know, defaults and everything else. But I think the thing that needs to understand, and if I was to suggest the next, next time there's a chart Let's have a chart that shows what the overall debt situation has been since the 1960s, and to really try to understand how this, these chronic problems are seriously aggravated by additional factors in the world economy, uh, and how they how they then become something that the developed countries feel they have to deal with. Which leads me to my second point, which is. There is such a huge gap between what the developed world is prepared to do for itself. In other words, what nations are prepared to do for themselves, wealthy nations, in the face of a crisis like this, as they did in 2008, 2009, uh, and what in fact they're prepared to do for everybody else. And this is, this is a really serious political problem. Um, watching the news is, and, and I don't know if you saw the any of the, of the talks yesterday, but Gillian Tett from the Financial Times gave a very, very good analysis at the end where she said, the problem, I see it as, an, as a journalist, and she was saying, the news in each country is all about each country. The news is not about what's happening in the world. If you're living in the United States, the news is about the United States. If you're living in Canada, the news is about Canada. It's not, we don't have enough shared consciousness of the problem. And this is a really serious political issue, if I may, uh, because it, it, it creates this, this enormous challenge that we constantly face to bring people in. The third is to understand what Stephanie pointed out. I think it was extremely helpful, if I may call you by your first name, Stephanie, I'm just feeling informal today. And to say, look, we need to figure out uh, uh, why and how commercial and Chinese debt became such a large part of the story because that tells us something about the, challenge, the political challenge that we face. And by the way, if you think that, it's easy, you're, you're wrong because 
in their in their public narrative, the Chinese government says, "Oh, we don't. We're not a big sovereign creditor. Um, it's all done by the private sector. This is commercial debt. We don't have anything to do with that." And and that is really not a helpful narrative because it's not actually true. But it also signals that the challenge that we're going to have and 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 integrating China into this process is going to be extremely uh, important, but also challenging politically. And the second, that because it demands, it requires an, a, 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 an extension of transparency and a willingness to accept responsibility, which is politically not as easy as it sounds. And the, the, the next thing is, of course, is private commercial creditors. Um, who, generally speaking, are not acting out of a sense of charity or public policy duty. They have, they have decided to move in because countries want them. And why do countries want them? Countries want them because although their money is more expensive, it comes with fewer conditions and requirements. And so that's why countries say, hey, it's flexible. It's 6% money, it's 9% money, but we'll take it because it's more flexible. This, this has been the pattern the last 15 years, and it's very risky. It, it, it creates huge problems when we get into a situation like this, where everybody says there's a public policy issue of debt. How do we solve it? And the answer is we don't really have the architecture. We're kind of making up the architecture as we go along, um, which is what we're seeing in terms of the improvisation that's come from the G20, from the IMF, from the World Bank, and others who are saying, this is how we have to try to do it. And my final point is that we need to be very careful uh, with respect to coming up with global solutions to uh, problems which will have a very differential impact on different, um, on different countries and different kinds of situations. Um, we all accept the need for uh, uh, climate change initiatives. We all accept the need for initiatives that, that are based on restoring biodiversity and, and addressing the ecological and environmental challenges that we face. But even in this eight months that I've been at the, in, in on the General Assembly, I've learned something. And that is every country sees it a little bit differently. And uh, we have to be very careful of imposing a kind of global cookie cutter approach on everybody. First of all, adaptation money for most developing countries is way more important than mitigation money. Way more important uh, because of the nature of the impact that climate change is having now. It's not a future problem, it's a today problem. And the, those infrastructure dollars just aren't there, they need to be there. And they need to be there on concessional terms. And, and related to that is the fact that in, in, as I've understood development theory as it's evolved many different dimensions over many years, ownership is a very important thing. It's very difficult to have national ownership if you're imposing one international global approach. And that I think is something we have to, we have to come to grips with in, in appreciating the sensitivities that are gonna be coming from the developing world as it, as it responds to whatever initiatives are are brought forward. Canada's purpose in all of this has been to create a space where there can be a real conversation between the advanced economies and developing economies. Um, there, are, there are other spaces at the UN to do this, like ECOSOC, for example, UNCTAD, and all of the agencies. But a lot of what happens there is really just people talking past each other. Um, and, and one of our objectives, which we've only partially achieved, I have to say, is to try to avoid um, you know, the prepared texts and the prepared uh, positioning and to try to get to a, a better and broader understanding of why, why this is as challenging as it is and how do you get from the, the very clear ideas and direction that we're receiving from the academic community and how do we actually get, get that to happen and make it happen. And uh, that's, I suppose, part of my job, but it's, it's, it's challenging. It's fun, but it's challenging uh, because it, it, it requires a real ability to listen to why some things are happening and other things are not. So to put it, put it in the simplest terms, the first problem is a lack of attention, focus, frankly, and empathy on the part of the developed world 
And secondly, uh, a, 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 a challenging political climate for many, many of the uh, uh, countries in the developing world where it's not simply a, an easy thing to say, okay, let's sign up for this. This is how it's going to get done. We've got to make sure that the pattern to get there, the road to get there is, um, is clearer than it currently is. Although I think the target we can all see in terms of what would be the sensible public policies, I think many of them have been outlined, but we have to figure out why has that been so difficult? And why is it so difficult now to actually move from aspiration to action, which is the name of the game? That's it. No slides. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador Ray. It's really great to hear your perspective from, from the place that you're coming at this from. And we really appreciate um, the time you're taking with us this morning to share it. I'm um, going to leave, I'm gonna have to leave a little early because I've got something at the General Assembly at 10 on Syria, but uh, I'll stay as long as I can. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm now gonna turn over to Jean-Paul Adam, um, who's Director for Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resource Management at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Mr. Adam, from the vantage point of UNECA, what are some of the priorities that you see in the growing debt crisis? Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and good afternoon from Addis Ababa to, to everyone. And uh, let me just say how much we appreciate uh, the opportunity to engage uh, in this uh, discussion uh, with the help of I IED and uh, IDRC, but also all the different perspectives that we've heard. So from the perspective of, of the United Nations Economic Commission of Africa, uh, we want to try and position debt swaps um, uh, away from simply uh, an opportunistic um, a means of uh, addressing certain debt situations and certain development situations to make it a mainstream development option. Uh, and that means uh, looking uh, at the issue of debt, at looking at the response to climate change, primarily as a development issue. And particularly in the context of Africa, climate change is a development issue because it is arguably putting a bigger burden on African countries even than COVID-19. And I think Sajal showed that in some of the slides uh, that have been worked on jointly with, uh, with ECA. Uh, the modeling that we've done within the African uh, Climate Policy Center, which is in with, within the Economic Commission for Africa, has shown that on average, we expect uh, two to 5% of GDP to be lost in African countries by 2030. And that's based on conservative warming estimates. In some more extreme warming estimates of above three degrees, in the Sahel, this could lead up to 15% of GDP being lost to climate change. And we should also note that African countries also have less resilience in dealing with um, the shocks linked to natural disasters associated with, um, uh, associated, uh, with uh, climate change. So for example, cyclones Idai and Kenneth in 2019 uh, led to some countries spending up to 9% of their GDP in responding to these kinds of disasters. Uh, so climate change is something which has been a burden for a long time and has been uh, cumulative over a period of time. COVID-19 is recent and the, the, the combined impact of the two is, is very dramatic. And the particular difference for African countries is their ability to respond. Uh, African countries uh, had a high fiscal de deficit at the middle of 2020 of uh, minus 8.13% of GDP. Uh, and in 2021, while it's expected to improve, uh, that estimate from the ECA is that it should not uh, probably go higher than minus 5.44% of GDP on average. Now, this is situated in among countries that already have very tax to GDP, very low tax to GDP ratios, and which have been falling since 2015. And the question is often asked, why are these tax to GDP ratios falling? Mainly because of the economic model, which is mostly uh, based on the exports of extractive industries with limited uh, value addition. And therefore the opportunity for additional uh, tax bases is, is limited. And this is shown by the fact that 11% of Africa's exports uh, are from the extractives natural resources sector, but they only account for less than 1% of employment. Now this contrasts with the, the approach that OECD countries have taken, which have essentially financed their response to COVID-19 through access to cheap and affordable uh, resources, which African countries don't have, whether they're least developed countries, middle income countries, or upper middle income countries. So unless we unlock the situation of debt, uh, 
uh, which allows African countries, particularly those that are middle income, to borrow affordably, we risk the lost decade that uh, Stephanie uh, has mentioned. The key opportunity, of course, is that it's the year of the Glasgow COP, where we have a number of uh, commitments that have already been made, for example, of uh, uh, committing to net zero by 2050 by a number of countries. This means that to reach those, those targets, there have to be meaningful uh, resources deployed. First and foremost, African countries will ask for the $100 billion per year commitment to be honored. But secondly, there's opportunity for additional finance, and this is where debt swaps in particular uh, can come in. The debt swaps uh, opportunity are particularly useful for countries that maybe are, are, are middle and upper middle income, uh, are not able to, to access easily from commercial markets, but can uh, identify uh, strategic opportunities to invest in areas that will also generate additional multiplier effects. And I think this is one of the questions that emerged in the, the chat was, how do you decide where to put this money without uh, having the, the dreaded word of conditionality? Uh, and I think one of the key things to keep in mind in the context of Africa is that for Africa, investment in climate resilience is not about meeting targets linked to the Paris Agreement or to Glasgow. It's about development. It's about building resilience to the shocks that, that we know are coming. And recent studies that we've done in ECA on the green recovery have actually shown that you get a better return on your investment in green sectors than you would through fossil fuel based sectors. And an example would be in South Africa, where it was shown that investments in renewable energy, sustainable electrified transport solutions, and nature-based rehabilitation would deliver 250% more jobs and 420% more value addition throughout the economy compared to similar investments that would have been done in fossil fuel-based investments. So if we can look at, uh, at strategic opportunities that countries have already identified themselves based on their economic priorities, these are the key areas where we can channel the proceeds of debt swaps. The opportunity that's emerging as well ahead of the, the spring meetings is that with the increased uh, uh, issuance of, of SDRs, uh, the opportunities as well to use the World Bank's policy guarantee mechanism to reduce the cost of private sector financing through bonds, for example, means that you could re refinance debt in some cases by issuance of new bonds on more affordable terms uh, and uh, supported by credit enhancements from DFIs. Again, we go back to the point of how do we support countries themselves in the priorities that they have, whether it's to provide energy through renewables or whether it's to unlock the job opportunities that are linked to nature-based solutions. And I'll conclude my, my remarks by uh, going to my own experience. And uh, uh, I, I previously worked in the Seychelles government and we did do a debt swap uh, in 2015. It was for a low amount, and I think that's one of the challenges, how do we upscale? But we started with the principle that we wanted to protect 30% uh, of our exclusive economic zone. And we had that, I, that principle for different reasons. Firstly, because it, it, it's a destination that was uh, marketing itself around uh, the, the, the pristine nature of its ocean. Uh, fisheries were very important and studies have shown, there's a recent study that has just come out that has shown that for every 5% increase in marine protected areas, assuming that they are properly targeted, you get a 20% catch increase um, over, over time, starting from five years uh, after the designation. So there were real reasons as to why we wanted to designate that. Uh, and we mobilized resources on the basis of that. So we start with what the countries want to do and link that with building climate resilience and responding to COVID-19 by creating jobs and multiplier effects in the economy. Thanks so much. It's really been a pleasure to have this discussion. Thank you so much for that contribution. It's really appreciated. And it's great to hear um, some of those very concrete examples that you're able to bring forward. Um, so this sort of concludes the portion where we have the panelists um, and our practitioners speaking, and we're gonna move into the Q&A section. Um, but there's a few questions that have already been posed in the chat. Now, there's about 15 minutes for this portion. So I would just ask if panelists could keep their comments fairly short to allow us to get through a number of different questions. Um, perhaps where I'll start is the first question, which is here, which came in and some comments touch on the point of conditionality, which I believe Jean-Paul just spoke about um, a minute ago but good and bad, and that this is important for our objective to broaden the debate and ensure local actors are empowered to address these challenges. So the question that Hannah Ryder put forward 
and maybe a particular interest to some of you, and Jean-Paul, you may want to contribute some more on this, uh, Sejal and others. Um, there are some who are skeptical that linking debt relief with green and fair programs is just another way to create um, conditions for poor countries, just like structural adjustment programs in the 1990s, post a debt crisis that poor countries did not create themselves. How would the panel members address this concern? What kind of conditionalities would be good? Um, would NDCs uh, be a good instrument? And then for Dev, um, there's a specific question on how you reconcile the use of KPIs with participatory ownership principles. We know that meta frameworks do not work if imposed and the use of KPIs and targets must be done very carefully lest they become a tool for imposition. The history of centralized management has unfortunately done the opposite of improving ownership in certain situations. So I'm gonna open the floor to the panelists, but perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll ask Ambassador Ray, I know, I know you need to leave shortly, if there's any comments that you wanted to add to, to any of the questions that have come forward first, and then I'll go to the other panelists. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm in the interest of, of time and giving, <laughs> giving others an opportunity, um, I, I just wanna be clear that I, I'm, not, um, I'm not at all arguing against uh, the need for um, major um, climate change investments, quite the contrary. I'm just suggesting that uh, we, in, order, in order for us to be effective, we really have to fully, fully understand the nature of the overall financial and debt situation in, in developing countries. And that I think that, that we, we, there's, there's often two worlds, right? You've got the, the climate change uh, folks who are coming up with all sorts of, of creative ideas and, and uh, various various ways in which uh, these issues can be addressed. And, and one, of, one of Canada's arguments has been here at the UN is to say, yes, indeed, but, or and, we need to understand why it's proving so difficult and we need to understand why there's such a gap between, um, between what I call aspiration and, and reality. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, understanding better the nature of the, the real financial and economic challenges facing the developed world and how often uh, gov governments in advanced economies come up with approaches either through the departments of development or departments of the environment or elsewhere that really have nothing to do with the extent of the problem. Just to give you a simple, a simple uh, example, in the, in the $100 billion target for uh, climate change financing, which is, you know, we haven't reached yet, but we, but there, it will be re-announced this year and we'll get, we'll, there'll be additional funds put forward. Um, it's really important that we understand that most of this financing isn't going to work unless it's really concessional. Um, and, and traditionally departments of the finance um, aren't keen on that. They say, well, no, no, we got to, it's got to be based on some interest return, et cetera. And you say, yeah, but if you do that, you're, you, it's simply not gonna happen. They're not gonna take it up because they're so severely indebted that there's no way they're gonna do it. Now, if you're a department of finance, you say, well, too bad, that, that's okay, they don't take it up. It's not in our lives, not in our, not in our balance sheet, they don't, no problem. But if you're actually looking at the real development need, you need to understand um, the particular situation that gives rise to the demand for uh, for concessional finance. And underneath that, you, you, you've got to deal with the issue of, of over, the debt overhang, which is the, there from you know, all, all of what is, all is what has passed and has been ac accumulated. Um, and that's why there's going to have to be um, debt cancellation. There's going to have to be uh, debt reduction. Um, there's going to have to be a different approach to debt than frankly, most uh, countries are embracing at the moment. We're, we're still not there yet. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Ray. Um, really appreciate it. I'm sorry I have to run, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pass over to the other panelists, but I'm actually going to add um, one additional question as I send it back to you, just following from that, which is a question from Roy Culpepper um, about Ambassador Ray's welcome assertion that for developing countries, adaptation is way more important than mitigation. And why is this view not universally shared and expressed and resources allocated accordingly? Because I suspect many of you may have views on that as well. I realize that's a little bit of a collection of questions, but I think that may be a good way to try and answer a number of them in the short time that we have. 
Sejal, can I turn to you next um, between the, the three or four different questions I've now posed? Um, and then feel free to pick up on the ones that seem most relevant. Sure. Um, so maybe if I start with the question about um, adaptation being more important than mitigation in, um, in many of these countries that we're talking about. Uh, if you look at the collective emission um, emissions of the 47 LDC countries, that amounts to less than 1% of annual greenhouse emissions um, globally. So we're talking about very little emissions that these countries are already emitting. So it isn't about reducing the amount of emissions for those countries. It's more about supporting them um, to, to, go, to build climate resilient development pathways, um, as well as to adapt to the impacts they're already facing. Um, so the mitigation side of it's a little bit more nuanced for those countries. Um, and, and what it does come down to is this kind of supporting broader economic development um, objectives, but in a way that is taking into account climate and nature. Um, so I, I think that also touches on the question about conditionality. It's not something that um, is imposed on those countries, but um, as I was saying in my presentation, it should be something that's linked to national strategies, national visions, and really working with what the country and um, at the national and consulted with the subnational actors in that country are seeing as the needs for um, for what activities need to take place to go on to those pathways. Um, and I'll I'll leave it there. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sejal. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll take different people in turn. Stephanie, is there anything that you'd like to add to the questions that have come forward? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, just to complement what Sejal said very clearly, um, I think that it is important for especially small low income countries to focus on adaptation and increasing their resilience. Um, but in some cases, uh, actually doing things that are mitigation um, like having renewable energy, which may be actually cheaper as well, making, making energy then more affordable, for example, for poor people, for economic activity in general, um, it may be better for their development. So I think there are parts of, of, of uh, mitigation that are also good uh, for the countries themselves and not just good globally. But I totally agree and endorse what Francis Stewart said in the chat box, which the idea is to start from own conditionality for a country to design its own program consistent with SDGs and, and their own NDC, and then have some kind of monitoring. I think that would be the best. My other point, I wanted to briefly say that we're talking here about debt relief. But this is only part of the international financial and development finance architecture. Of course, as was mentioned, we need more SDRs. Uh, and I think it would be good, there was a question about that, not only to have this first one, but perhaps uh, next year, as, as the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa suggested, have a second uh, SDR allocation. Um, but also, and I think we have not mentioned this, I think it's extremely important to increase the capital of multilateral development banks, including the regional development banks, so that they can lend more. It's not just about debt relief, it's also about new money. And ideally money, which is either concessional, as the ambassador said, or at fairly low interest rates and long maturities. And finally, I would finish with saying that I have some doubts about the suitability of private flows, particularly uh, for very poor countries, because these flows are very volatile. Having been a chrysologist for a long time, I've seen these flows come and go, uh, damaging the development prospects of countries. And so they, they, they are quite costly, they're fairly short term and they can create major development problems as well as debt crisis. So I think that um, giving so much importance to regain market access, for, particularly for very poor countries, uh, is maybe not the, the most important goal from a development perspective. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, can I pass over to Jean-Paul um, for any reflections that he has on the questions? So uh, the firstly on the adaptation and, and uh, mitigation question, uh, 
the uh, the priority has always been for African countries on adaptation because, uh, and they've expressed that because of the lack of flow of funds that have been, that have been going to adaptation from the from the GCF, for example. So that focus has really been trying to recalibrate the balance. But it would be, uh, and uh, to, to give another example of, of the statistic that Sajal mentioned, um, in, in Africa, the whole of Africa um, represents just 3.8% of global emissions, while being home to 17% of the global population. So you can see that per capita, Africa is really a long way behind. Uh, but that, that shows as well the need for investment, not in mitigation, but in energy. But if it's done around renewables, it, it actually contributes towards uh, mitigation. And uh, as Stephanie pointed out, these are some of the, the easy investments that should be done uh, as soon as possible for different reasons. Firstly, if done right, they create more local jobs. Uh, they, they, they also, uh, and a study done by Arena actually showed that in terms of the gender balance as well, uh, in renewables, 32% uh, usually go to women, as opposed to fossil fuels, where it's it's less than 22%. So there's a 10% differential in terms of, for example, the gender balance, even though 32% is still not good enough. Uh, but the investment in renewables creates jobs quickly uh, and, uh, and, and, and higher value jobs, which then create further multiplier effects as well when you're connecting more people uh, to the electricity grid. There are 590 million people in Africa who still don't have access to electricity. So we need to mobilize finance for energy, not because of mitigation, because Africa is net positive, we could even argue, but because we need to invest in energy and energy is perhaps one of the main priorities. But around adaptation, there's, there's huge opportunities as well. And the studies that we've done have shown that there is a, a huge job creation potential around adaptation-based activities, particularly around, and here you can have a linkage with uh, food security on the African continent where developing climate smart agriculture um, is, is going to be a priority because it's, it's about efficient use of the space. Uh, because even though Africa still has some of the highest rates, highest levels of forest cover in the world, it also has the, the highest rate of deforestation. So the trend is, is, is negative. Uh, but countries themselves have already identified a number of these opportunities for investment. And I will point in particular to the uh, African Union Green Stimulus Program, which was adopted in January, which has focused very much around uh, nature-based solutions, around uh, developing uh, these investments in agroforestry, uh, climate smart agriculture uh, for food production. And I think that we can really uh, address the issue of con conditionality by looking at priorities that African countries have already emphasized themselves. And access to uh, cheaper resources should be linked as well to the goals uh, of, of the Paris Agreement and uh, the SDGs. And the work that we're doing in ECA are also working with uh, four countries in West Africa to support them in developing programs that would allow them to access, for example, uh, debt swaps but building on the basis of what they want to do, what are the priorities that will create the most jobs for them and create economic opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, I recognize that we're at time for the, the webinar this today, um, but I, I would like to just ask your indulgence because I'd like to turn to Dev and give him an opportunity for a couple of minutes just to, to reply to some of the questions and particularly the very specific one that was asked of him. Um, so Dev, I'll turn over to you. Um, yes, let, let me try to, to address that uh, specific uh, issue which was not uh, taken up by the others. Uh, uh, this always about KPIs. Uh, the big, the big uh, usual natural instinct is to think that this is, well, so-called best practice is going to be imposed, it's going to be, to be brought up from the top to bottom, and suddenly you get into trouble. So I would agree with the comment made uh, in terms of trying to do something which actually the, the countries in question recognize. So we've been talking about this national ownership, looking at what actually happens. So when we are talking about those programs, so we're looking at what is happening at the climate level, the nature level, the biodiversity level, look at the national adaptation plan and try to find out certain elements there that the 
countries recognize. So yes, you can come up with a list of KPIs, which is like going to be uh, ad, uh, put across countries, but they need to be adapted to the local reality. Otherwise then it's, it's not going to be useful for tracking anything because KPIs is about putting something there to actually track progress. So this is the way I can see it happen. And we've tried it in some other cases, not on climate, but it does work. So that, that would be my answer on that rather than imposing it from the top. No. Okay, that's one. Secondly is on this conditionality. Every time I, I put conditionality on my slide as well, in it, reluctantly, because it's always have a negative connotation. But um, again, what we need to look at here is using the SDGs, using at something which is what, what somebody was mentioning, the positive side, something that uh, when we are talking about those countries, they say, okay, this, I can do that. And in climate, for instance, there are a number of things and I think there was a comment made about the national uh, <clears throat> determined con uh, contributions, et cetera. So we could bring in those particular elements where the, the ownership is there, the people whom we're talking, the stakeholders that matter, they actually can recognize it rather than something coming up from, uh, from, 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 from far away and being imposed and that's not going to work. So I think the whole approach of putting in certain conditions and I, if, if somebody can come up with some words, conditionality, something else, that would be great because it has from the beginning, it has had a, a negative connotation. And finally on this uh, adaptation mitigation, I think uh, there is a weight, uh, a balance that needs to be done. My own work in some countries where I've seen it there. Um, they need both, but it's a question of where they are and how to actually make it work. So I think I rest my case here. Thank you so much, Dev. And, and I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the presenters, the panelists, the audience, and colleagues who posed questions um, during the webinar today. Um, I know our time has been short, um, there's still a lot of information to digest, some questions we weren't able to get to, but I really hope that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, at IDRC, where I work and with our partners, we'll continue to develop ways of supporting local research and evidence on today's challenges. And the presentations we've seen today really emphasize and make clear that growing debt, unfortunately, is one of them, adding to the pandemic and the climate crisis. It's impossible for me to try and sum up all of the, the rich information discussion we've had today. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna try to do it in, in, a, in a sort of holistic way, but I will mention that from my point of view, um, one of the big takeaways is how important it is that we invest in local knowledge and capacity to manage the growing debt crisis. In particular, and I know it's something my colleagues following um, the session will be thinking more about, is, is what more we can do to tackle the crises in an integrated manner. The integrated solutions that are needed um, to be both global and local, and we'll be working on expanding the platform that we have to amplify voices from the South, working with local researchers and networks supporting the achievement of the SDGs. I think the presentations today um, gave us a rich um, basis for discussion and reflection and some clear priorities for debt management in the coming years. Um, issues around international architecture, which needs to be broadened, including working more with the private sector and with other actors. National governments need to be in the driving seat of the management of debt and donors uh, need to support this through mutually agreed and performance-based frameworks. Um, and as we've highlighted, new approaches need to be both integrated and inclusive. Um, I will highlight that today we've not said a lot about, um, about inclusion, but on Thursday is the, we'll be hosting another webinar that looks at how gender can be integrated into debt management. And then finally, I do want to pick up on something that Ambassador Ray mentioned and many of you mentioned around the urgency of the work that we need to do and the hard work that will be needed going forward. So with that, um, let me thank you all for joining us today, for being part of this discussion. I want to particularly thank our speakers, um, such a fantastic panel of people with such really deep and rich experience that they took the time to share for, uh, with us. We hope to see you again on Thursday um, in our webinar on gender and in the future as we continue this discussion. We wish you all to stay well and stay safe during these challenging times. Thanks very much.